For over 100 years, film critics have been ones that we could turn to for a thoughtful review, analysis, and understanding of what's new in cinemas near us. They would help us decide if a film was right for us, give us a general idea and understanding of what to expect, and to give us insight on its storytelling, its writing and direction, cinematography, characters and their development, and usage of literary and visual elements. These individuals usually had a deep understanding of filmmaking, good storytelling, and the film industry as a whole. But as times have changed and evolved, so has cinema. In the present day, why is it that we don't look towards film critics as we used to? Why do they receive so much backlash for their reviews? Why is it that film critics are no longer trusted? Make sure you subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on my latest video essays along with the Walking Dead content. In this video, we'll take a look at a couple of different points as to the distrust audiences have grown for movie critics. To support our points, we'll talk about the divisiveness for fans and critics when it comes to a movie rating and what's actually being rated, the problem that is the biased critics, and finally, an overall differentiating opinion. If you're anything like me, before you go and see a movie, whether it's in theaters or at the comfort of your own home, you check some ratings online. You're curious to how others have reacted to the film to see if it's right for you, but there's a good chance you skip over the critics' rating, focusing your attention to the audience reviews and what they have to say. And this is a very popular thing. I hear a lot of people say that if the audience rating score is high while the critic score is low, they'll go see the movie. When it's the opposite, a low audience score and a high critic score, they'll stay away from it. When I took a poll on Instagram, 17 people said they read the critics' review, while 201 people head for the general audiences. We went from trusting the solid word of the professionals to taking the opinion of the audience. And here's why. The early 2000s brought real change to cinema, with science fiction, action, and comic book movies only becoming more and more popular. Sure, they existed before then, but the 2000s saw their rise to fame and glory, with movies such as X-Men, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, Batman Begins, and what would forever change the future of comic book and superhero movies, Marvel Studios' Iron Man. These movies, while being a fun, action-filled adventure and sometimes even telling a great story, were easy for a critic to tear down and it still remains that way. They're divisive films, satisfying an audience with action and laughs, but disappointing critics with everything else. Let's take a look at 2018's Venom for an example. Venom, starring Tom Hardy, has an 81% audience rating score on Rotten Tomatoes, which is pretty good. That's around the average Marvel standard for a superhero flick, but the critics have a strong distaste, giving it a 30%. Audiences love it because it's a fun movie. It has fun characters and plots, pretty good action and decent and CGI, and tons of moments guaranteed to get some laughs. The critics, on the other hand, slammed the flick for poor storytelling and only giving into making the movie filled to the brim with action and mediocre special effects. The critics were looking for something more, something to make the film stand out, but it was just another action movie audiences went crazy for. Venom is undoubtedly a flawed film. It has its issues, but it's fun. An average person with minimal knowledge of the character can sit down and enjoy the movie for what it's worth, yet it's the critics' job to analyze the film on a deeper level and look into its elements much more, with the flaws only becoming more and more apparent. They don't turn their brains off to watch a sci-fi action movie like a lot of people do, so it only makes sense for their criticism to be harsher. That's the reason the review won't be trusted though. The average moviegoer doesn't care about the style it was directed in, they just want to enjoy a movie with some popcorn. So the audience ratings better reflect their mindset because the audience too isn't analyzing the movie on a deeper basis. By human nature, we all hold some sort of bias, no matter what it may be towards. Some biases may be conscious or unconscious, but in the world of film criticism, there shouldn't be any. When I asked my Instagram followers why they don't trust critics, a fair amount replied by saying it's because they're biased which they can be. The best example of this came November of 2021, when Ghostbusters Afterlife hit theaters. The battle between Ghostbusters Afterlife and the 2016 reboot is something I've covered already on this channel, but for a quick rundown, when the 2016 reboot of the original Ghostbusters was released, audiences tore the movie apart for being unfunny, having poor writing, and terrible CGI. Critics, on the other hand, praised the movie for its female empowerment, despite some obvious stereotypes. The reboot then became a political matter, even with then-presidential candidate Donald Trump commenting on the notion of an unnecessary reboot. Can't do that. And now they're making Ghostbusters with only women. What's going on? 
This only paved the way for biased critics to unfairly review the film for political reasons. So when a legacy sequel film was released, set in the original Ghostbusters universe, those biased critics attacked the movie for ignoring the canon of the reboot. Most notably was the review by Charles Bramisco for The Guardian, which reads, Consider the casual cowardice of a script that uses its own mythology to subtly erase 2016's All Gals reboot from the canon, given the rage-choked trolls carpet-bombing IMDb with zero-star ratings the vindication they've always craved. Using the reboot as a precedent to a legacy sequel is not fair for a valid review, only making it one-sided and favorable to the reboot, while bashing this one for not being a sequel to it rather than properly analyzing and reviewing what the film is worth on its own. Knowing critics were biased like this, it turned people off at the idea of them. Audiences and fans of the 1984 Ghostbusters have praised this film for being as caring as it was towards the original, amounting to a 94% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, while the critics' rating sits at 63%, considerably lower than the reboot, only making their biased ways apparent to all. This isn't the only example of critics being biased though, because as political tensions seem to only grow, it seeps into reviews that should have nothing to do with anything on a political basis. And oftentimes, we hear of films not being diverse enough by the movie critic standard. You see, some critics sit down with a checklist of diversity, and when there's not enough that reaches what they want, they blast the film. Now, I'm all for diversity in film, and I love to see other races and groups be properly represented by its story or its cast, but it shouldn't be required for every movie released. Having a ton of diversity wouldn't make sense in certain films. Could you imagine if the movie 1917 had a squadron of all-female soldiers running into battle? It doesn't make sense because because this film is paying historical accuracy to the First World War. So having a diversity bias against a film isn't a valid criticism either, because not only may it not fit the story, but it's not how the creator imagines their characters. Since the dawn of time, humans have been forming their own opinions that differentiate from others, and when it comes to film, there's no exception. And the great thing about opinions is that we're entitled to them, even when we may disagree with someone else's. When I asked my Instagram followers why they don't trust critics, the majority brought up opinion, one of the fairest points to be made. Film critics are human, and when they stray away from the facts of a film such as its cinematography, lighting, whatever else it may be, everything else becomes a matter of opinion and taste. The critics have opinions just as much as we do, and they vary just as much. If you have someone reviewing a big summer blockbuster action flick like Spider-Man Homecoming, but the person reviewing it doesn't like action and prefers a gritty noir detective film, well their review will reflect their opinion of not liking action. That's just how it is. Replying to my question prompt on Instagram, Instagram, cheap earbuds, or David, had this to say, Opinions are opinions. Everyone's is different. They can't cover every angle or opinion of the movie and can only review it based on their opinions. No two people can have the same connection to any work of fiction, so there's no guarantee that the critic's review will truly reflect the movie as you see it. And David, if you're watching this, you couldn't be any more correct. We interpret things differently by opinion, and not all critics can properly represent that in their reviews. Ghostbusters 1984 is a movie I can connect with, and I think it's one of the greatest movies ever made, but many would disagree with that notion. It has a special charm to it for me. I see it a certain way, but a critic may think it's a dumb comedy because they simply don't see it how I do. I interpret the ending of American Psycho closely to how Cinema Blend does, but there's many other professionals that see it much differently than I do. I think that most, if not all the killings committed by Patrick Bateman actually happened, except the killing of Paul Allen. Many others may interpret the confusing and ambitious ending as seeing the world from Bateman's psychotic and twisted mind but I don't. If someone reviewed this movie and gave it a 20% because they believe all the killings actually didn't happen, well that's their opinion that I disagree with. Roger Ebert, hailed as one of the greatest critics of all time, said he thought Home Alone 3 was better than the first two, and I'm sure many watching this are taken back by that remark. It's hard to trust a critic's opinion, or really any opinion for that matter, because we all see things differently from each other. For whatever reason it may be, perhaps even a reason not mentioned in this video, it's okay not to trust critic reviews. And it is okay to also trust them. There can be critics out there that usually properly reflect your opinion and views when it comes to a movie. And finding one who best represents your beliefs is great. At the end of the day, it comes down to opinion and how the viewer interprets what's on screen. 
even if a critic is biased. Many would say Morbius is peak cinema, but those who aren't into Jared Leto's method acting may beg to differ. There's great movie reviewers out there, and there are some terrible ones. Just like a movie, whether a film critic is good or bad is open to your opinion and interpretation. Feel free to share your thoughts and opinions in the comments below. Let me know if you agree or disagree with the points made in this video, and if you trust film critics or not. Also leave a like on this video if you enjoyed, and be sure to subscribe for many more video essays coming your way. Be sure to check out my last one going over why Ghostbusters Afterlife was a success, and why the 2016 reboot was a failure. Thanks everyone for watching, stay safe, and have a great day.